Good morning. Welcome to the Future of Work Leadership Conference hosted by the Bellevue Chamber of Commerce. I'm Jared Axelrod, Senior Manager of Public Policy at Amazon and a member of the Bellevue Chamber Board of Directors. And unfortunately, I'm without power this morning at, at my house, so say what you will about the benefits of working from home. But regardless, Amazon is proud to be the presenting sponsor of this year's Leadership Conference. This year's virtual conference, spread out over the course of the summer, has provided participants the opportunity to hear a range of topics on one central theme. What does the future of work look like? The idea for this theme was created a number of months ago, but the events of this year with the COVID-19 pandemic and the ensuing economic downturn have turned that theme on its head. Businesses everywhere have had to rethink what the future of work really looks like. And if you've tuned, tuned into these sessions in the last several weeks, you've heard a range of perspectives and insights on the future of work. And I hope you found those lessons insightful. But the unpredictability of this year has reminded me of a quote I heard recently. It's easier to create the future than predict it. For Amazon's part, we want to be a part of creating that future. Our Dean Williams, Amazon's Vice President of Workforce Development, spoke at this conference back in June about ways the company is helping create this future, including investing in our workforce to retrain them for in-demand fields, and investing in STEM and computer science education to train students from elementary age to college age with the skills they need for the jobs of tomorrow. At Amazon, we'll continue to look for more and new ways to serve our customers and help our communities, and I know that many others will do the same. I continue to remain optimistic about our future. And with that, I'd like to hand things off to Joe Fain, President and CEO of the Bellevue Chamber, where he'll give us some updates on what's been happening at the Chamber. Joe? Thank you, Jared. We really appreciate the support that Amazon has provided the Bellevue Chamber and the extraordinary partner that you've been to the city as Amazon grows its operation here on the east side. Thank you. Today is the final webcast in our summer-long Future of Work Leadership Conference. We are grateful to all the speakers for sharing their time and talents with us, and we appreciate all of you who have attended over the past two months. During that time, we've heard from entrepreneurs, industry leaders, technology titans, healthcare experts, and many others through the unique format. Now that we want to hear from you, the Bellevue Chamber has many exciting virtual speakers and programs set for this fall, and we need your help to make them pop. So at the end of today's program is a short three question survey to help us provide our digital programming a boost. Please take a moment and tell us how we did. As we announced last week, our usually sold out economic forecast summit sponsored by Bank of America is going virtual. In addition to our world-renowned economist and Bank of America Chief Strategist, Joe Quinlan, we're adding a number of breakout sessions for virtual attendees to select during the event. On your screen is a link to a survey with 11 program topics for our breakout sessions. Based on your feedback, we'll be providing top speakers or panelists from the most popular topics from our poll. In addition to selecting our topics, you'll be entered to win a starter membership with the Bellevue Chamber that you can gift to any qualifying non-member business of your choice. So vote now to enter and make sure you save the date, November 17th, 2020. We also want you to mark your calendars for this year's annual gala. We're again staying virtual, but we'll have some big announcements about our unique format, program, and speakers early next month. This year's event is on October 8th, so click the link to mark your calendars. As always, don't forget to post on social media about your experience as a Future of Work Leadership Conference attendee by tagging at Bellevue Chamber. We'll be monitoring Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn throughout the program. And the winner will get 100 cloth masks and three bottles of sanitizer provided by our generous partnership with the King County Office of Emergency Management. Finally, I'd like to thank our sponsors and table captains who have generously supported the series. We've already heard from this year's presenting sponsor, Amazon, and we'd also like to thank our major sponsors, AT&T, Microsoft, Puget Sound Energy, King County, the City of Bellevue, our corporate sponsors, Falco Salt and the Port of Seattle, and our associate sponsors, ASIS Northwest Network and the University of Washington. We couldn't make this happen without our virtual conference table captains as well, including HDR, Seattle Children's, AAA of Washington, ARVR Studio, The Partners Group, Sweeney Conrad, GMI, Her Interactive, and Accelerate. Now, today's program is going to be a little shorter today, but it is also very special. 
Our speaker is one of the most experienced and plugged in leaders in our national healthcare industry. So we are taking the unique step of shortening his overall presentation to accommodate a little more time for Q&A from you. So fill those chat boxes and use the Q&A feature to ask about everything COVID and beyond. And to get us started is a healthcare leader and innovator in her own right. Please welcome Doctor of Public Health and the President and CEO of Life Science Washington, Leslie Alexander. Leslie, are you able to connect him? There we go. Thanks, Joe, for your leadership at the Bellevue Chamber and for inviting me to participate in this morning's exciting session. And uh, sorry for whatever technical snafu just happened. I appreciate the opportunity to share some of the incredible work taking place throughout our region to combat and prevent future outbreaks of SARS-CoV-2, the novel coronavirus known as COVID-19. For those of you unfamiliar with Life Science Washington, we connect our hundreds of members to each other and do funding, talent, partnerships, and essential business services. And we elevate our industry by promoting policies that strengthen the environment for groundbreaking research and product development that improves and saves lives. Our member companies and research institutes are on the forefront of the fight against COVID-19 and have been since the genetic code for the virus was published in China on January 10th. Using that code as a fingerprint, Dr. Trevor Bedford of Fred Hutch and colleagues in Switzerland created a very accurate tracking mechanism to chase the virus across the globe, monitoring its every genetic change along the way. Right here in Bellevue, the Institute for Disease Modeling is applying cutting edge data science and computer modeling to create sophisticated epidemiological models for predicting where and how the virus will attack next. And University of Washington's Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation continues to update in real time the models it has built for estimating new cases, hospitalizations, and deaths from COVID-19 in different regions based on parameters such as social distancing, wearing a mask, and many other cons considerations. When it comes to understanding the immunology of the virus, look no further than the extraordinary collaboration between two of our local companies, Adaptive Biotechnologies and Microsoft. Originally forged to bring the, the power of Microsoft's AI machine learning and cloud computing to Adaptive's quest to identify changes in the human adaptive immune system indicative of disease before symptoms even appear. The arrival and urgency of COVID brought a swift expansion in the partnership to clarify the immune response to COVID-19. Known as immune code, the results of this research are being placed in the public domain as quickly as possible to stimulate and support more research on diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. Dozens of local life science companies are engaged in this research with collaborations being forged at unprecedented speed and initial results coming fast and furious, coming fast and furiously. Having identified the first domestic case of coronavirus in nearby Kirkland, it is fitting that the first dose of the first vaccine to enter human clinical trials in the United States was given in Seattle at Kaiser Permanente Research Institute. Fast forward and we can now be proud that all of the phase three clinical trials of coronavirus vaccines here in the US are being coordinated and managed at Fred Hutch by its former president, Dr. Larry Corey, a world renowned virologist who has really appeared to doctor and a friend to Dr. Anthony Fauci. Our region's robust medical device industry has risen to the challenge as well with Bothell-based Sonocyte massively expanding the manufacturing of its handheld ultrasounds to be used to monitor COVID-induced lung damage right at the patient's bedsides. 
and previously unknown Ventec Life Systems, an emerging medical device company with a small, lightweight, and therefore mobile multifunction ventilator became a national sensation when it established a partnership with General Motors to massively scale production of ventilators in a refurbished auto, pan, auto plant in Kokomo, Indiana. There are many more wonderful stories like these that we can all be proud of, but I know the story we are all most interested in is the one we are about to hear from this morning's guest speaker. Mark McClellan, MD, PhD, is Director and Robert J. Margolis, MD, Professor of Business, Medicine, and Pol Policy at the Margolis Center for Health Policy at Duke University. He is a physician economist who focuses on quality and value in healthcare, including payment reform, real-world evidence, and more effective drug and device innovation. Dr. McClellan is at the center of the nation's efforts to combat the pandemic to combat the pandemic, and he's the author of a roadmap that details the steps needed for a comprehensive COVID-19 response and safe reopening of our country. He is former administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and former commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, where he developed and implemented major reforms in health policy. He is an independent director on the boards of Johnson & Johnson, Cigna, Alignment Healthcare, and SEER, and is co-chair of the Guiding Committee for the Healthcare Payment Learning and Action Network. Please help me welcome Dr. McClellan to the webcast. Well, Leslie, thank you very much for that kind introduction, and, and thanks especially for all that the life science, life, life sciences companies are doing in Washington to make a difference in every phase of this pandemic. I'm going to talk through some of those issues, but as you said, uh, what's going on there in the Seattle, greater Washington um, uh, area is making a big difference. also want to thank uh, Joe and the Chamber for this opportunity to join you, my brother Scott McClellan, local resident there is a is a strong supporter of all the the great work that that you all are doing uh and of course that uh, thanks to to jared and amazon and the sponsors for this effort on the future of work and as jared said probably no bigger influence on the future of work in the coming years not just during the pandemic than what we're living through right now and how we uh, respond to it and the critical role of business leadership in that response so what i wanted to talk about in uh a few minutes of remarks with you today, maybe 15, 20, uh, is uh, where I see where we are in the pandemic now, some of the changes that probably need to happen. It's no secret that the U.S. response has been more challenging than in many places around the world with economic and, and other consequences for our, uh, our health, our educational systems, as well as our workers. Um, and then look ahead, uh, too, in terms of the promise of the therapeutics that are coming, but also promises from uh, better diagnostic technologies and other things that, that I think are going to shape the future of, of work uh, well beyond getting through this pandemic. And of course, anything you all want to talk about along the way is is is, is great with me as well. Uh, so uh, just uh, if we go to the, the next slide, just a little bit of an introduction to our center at Duke. We're a kind of unique program. We're a university-wide program at Duke, but we also have a big uh, office with faculty and staff base in Washington, D.C., where we collaborate pretty closely with federal agencies and national efforts on a range of health policy issues, uh, like uh, transforming our healthcare system, uh, uh, like uh, supporting better biomedical innovation and bringing these uh, changes globally. And in those efforts, we've collaborated a lot with people in the Washington area. Um, uh, uh, Leslie mentioned IHME is doing a great job of tracking and modeling the pandemic, not only in the U.S., uh, but worldwide. Uh, companies that are developing innovative diagnostic and ther therapeutic approaches. I was just on the, a call recently with Chad Robbins from uh, Adaptive uh, and uh, have uh, really respected the work that Trevor Bedford's been doing that actually got this epidemic on the map in the United States at a time when uh, people weren't looking as closely as, as they should have been. And, and Trevor's work um, really set us up for uh, trying to take some more effective steps towards addressing the pandemic. And in our work at the center, we focus on several overlapping areas that are pretty common in, um, when pandemics arise. Uh, first is, is containment. Uh, by definition, when you start out in a pandemic, you don't have any effective medical 
therapy. So it's the non-medical interventions that really matter. Things like uh, distancing and closures and the like. Uh, how do you do those as effectively as possible? So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, second um, is accelerating the development of therapeutics and, and vaccines, the treatments that are ultimately going to make a big difference in getting us beyond uh, this pandemic. And that's happening at an unprecedented pace. But it's because we're facing an unprecedented challenge in terms of the scale and the scope of impact. And, and that's where we're really running into some problems as well, uh, not just uh, in developing the diagnostics and the therapeutics we need, but making sure they can be available at scale uh, for the, uh, the unprecedented national um, scale, this public and global scale, this public health emergency. And finally, um, a few thoughts if we have time about healthcare. Uh, just like business is going to look different coming out of this, healthcare is already looking different. And I think it's going to change even further uh, as we try to find more effective ways to, to deal with COVID-19. Um, so uh, for the next slide, I just wanted to um, mention where some of that early work that we did that um, Leslie alluded to around a, a safe reopening strategy for the country. Uh, we began work on this uh, topic along with collaborators like Scott Gottlieb at the American Enterprise Institute and other former FDA commissioner and experts at Johns Hopkins and, and other universities on how to reopen safely. And these are still relevant factors to consider today, uh, even though we're much further along in the pandemic with, I think, much more spread and, and much more active cases than people were hoping for back in the back in the spring. Uh, but the key factors that have worked around the world are ones that um, we try to apply here, things like uh, getting to reductions in cases through non-medical interventions like distancing or even uh, more extreme isolations and, and lockdowns, like the, uh, the one that the ones that other countries have undertaken and the U.S. undertook to a, a considerable extent back in uh, March and, and April. Uh, second key feature is making sure your healthcare system is overwhelmed. The challenge with COVID is that it doesn't take that many cases. You know, people point out that um, we have infection rates now in the country of maybe um, I'm well under you know one percent of the population per day uh, with uh, 50, 60,000 cases doesn't seem like a big number in a country with um, more than 330 million residents. But as we've seen, especially if those cases are concentrated in a particular area, it doesn't take much to really fill up the emergency rooms. So uh, 6,000 cases a day, 15% requiring hospitalizations, uh, 5, 10% uh, requiring ventilation or other more intensive um, uh, interventions. Uh, and it's not long before emergency rooms, uh, ICUs are, are overwhelmed and you're in situations like we're facing in many parts of the country today where we're having to convert um, uh, hotels or convention space, uh, having to rely on some of those innovative um, ventilators that we talked about before uh, to really meet the, the challenges of the pandemic. And, and that can be very disruptive, not just for healthcare, but for all uh, economic activity in a, in a region, uh, not to mention uh, really undermining confidence that people have about the safety of going out and, and getting around if there's a, a significant chance that they or someone they love who's at higher risk could be uh, affected by the, the, the often serious consequences of COVID. We're getting better at treatment now, but uh, it's still not that far it uh, doesn't take that many cases to overwhelm health systems. And third is sufficient testing capacity. Uh, it's important to, to know whether someone with respiratory symptoms really does have COVID because that affects whether they need to isolate and whether we need to trace contacts to help with uh, containment. It's also important to know because of the fact that so much of the spread of this pandemic has been from people who are of no symptoms or minimal symptoms or who spread before they get symptoms. Uh, so diagnostic testing is particularly important in containing this pandemic as well. And we talked about the need for sufficient capacity in that area. Uh, and fourth is the ability to trace outbreaks when they occur, that you have enough People can do contact tracing, maybe augmented by apps like the ones that uh, uh, Google and Apple have developed uh, to find out for people who are in close contact with a known COVID case, how to, let, how to identify them, how to help them get tested and take steps to, uh, to further contain the outbreak. And the countries that have successfully contained COVID have pretty much done all of these 
things um, relatively effectively. More intensive shutdowns at the beginning to really slow spread, um, then uh, um, sufficient, not just sufficient hospital capacity, but sufficient testing capacity, testing and tracing capacity. You're seeing that happen again this week in uh, countries like New Zealand that thought they had had uh, containment uh, going back to, to um, uh, close to a, uh, a more extreme shutdown of Auckland than, than we had back in April, uh, backed up by rapid availability of testing to anyone with symptoms and any contacts and even the regions where they've seen uh, the, the outbreaks occur. Uh, so those are approaches that have worked. The U.S. has not been able to follow through on all of these kinds of steps. The, the next slide kind of uh, shows this. Um, the White House adopted some criteria for states reopening that matched at least the first three on that list that I showed you on the previous slide, declining cases, sufficient hospital capacity, and uh, sufficient testing capacity. Most of the states that reopened in April and May, and even in June, had one of those uh, in place, which was not an overwhelmed uh, healthcare system. Uh, we're a big and diverse country, and you know back in the spring, we had early outbreaks in some places like Seattle, uh, as well as New York, New Jersey, the Northeast, uh, that led to big surges in cases in those areas. Uh, as those ca uh, cases went down in May, uh, many of the other communities around the United States hadn't really had uh, significant COVID exposure yet. So the isolation steps uh, that took place in April and May in places like Texas and Florida kept big outbreaks from occurring, didn't lead to a complete eradication. You know, we never totally locked down like uh, many other countries did. We still had a lot of people out um, uh, with undertaking activities. We didn't have the level of enforcement that many Asian countries or, or Spain or, or, uh, or Italy did uh, as part of their uh, lockdown activities. So while we didn't see a big a rush in cases in many parts of the country. The, the virus wasn't gone either. And what we saw subsequently was surges in some of these other areas. Uh, so their health systems weren't overwhelmed, but there were cases there. There were some challenges in many parts of the country and getting testing available and doing the, the, the contact tracing. Uh, and as a result, uh, we've seen uh, further spreads in, in much of the U.S. So next slide. Uh, uh, shows what's going on uh, over this period. Now you can't read the the, the axes here are too small, but on the uh, the chart on the left, that's the new cases per day that we're recording in the United States, and across the horizontal, that's the time uh, starting back with that peak in April, mainly in the Northeast, as I talked about before. Um, we. Uh, got containment in that peak, but then uh, as cases in the Northeast continued to decline, we started seeing increases in some of these areas that never really had big outbreaks, never had their healthcare systems threatened before, and we're not taking uh, enough steps uh, through measures that we know work, face masks, distancing, uh, avoiding uh, crowds bigger than 10, uh, and that's what led to the second phase of this first wave of outbreaks. It's really the first wave hitting Texas, Florida, Arizona, to some extent, Washington, uh, again, California. Uh, and uh, we are now coming off a big surge in those cases. There's some questions since as you see that the testing we're doing has declined a little bit recently. That's the, the graph on the right side. So over this time, we started out with pretty low levels of testing using uh, diagnostic lab tests, uh, so-called PCR tests, like the one Trevor Bedford developed that are the gold standard for diagnosing somebody with, um, with COVID. So we're doing more of that testing almost than ever before. It's been a, a, a bit of a decline this past week that um, people are very concerned about understanding why. Um, but despite that, we've had lags in test availability and we've seen uh, uh, significant increases in, in cases in many other parts of the country. As those parts of the country have taken further non-medical steps like uh, uh, closing bars, limiting restaurant sizes, encouraging, requiring face mask use, uh, they've been able to get more of those outbreaks under control. But this is not a picture of a country that meets the kinds of standards that uh, we've talked about in that earlier report and that many other countries have been able to achieve. Uh, so we're operating now at a level where um, cases are declining in many states from those surges in July, that second phase of this first wave, uh, but uh, still um, a lot of COVID in our communities and uh, disrupting schools, economic and other activities. And, and the next slide 
Uh, uh, this shows uh, some of these changes over the past month. So um, uh, red is is uh, highest rate of uh, case increases uh, back in July on the left hand side, and green are states that were having declines then. As you can see, a lot of states that were not part of the first wave. Um, the New York, New England, um, uh, New Jersey wave, you know, those states were passed, but, but Texas, uh, some of the Midwest, some of the uh, Northwest that had not been hit before, Washington to some extent, uh, we're seeing increases in cases. That slow with these further steps we've taken uh, over the past month, um, but um, uh, we're certainly not done. And, and if you look at the next slide, you know, I know Washington in particular has had some challenges with keeping track of all the test data and reporting and, and so forth. Um, so some of this is not as, uh, uh, as accurate data as we'd really like to have at this phase in the pandemic. Um, but um, uh, many states are still having pretty high positive rates on the testing that they're doing. And that's not the only measure. There are others of, of how well a state is doing with control, uh, but it is a concerning one in many parts of the country, including uh, Washington and the ability to, to track tests there. Um, a lot of this data that I'm showing is from a website called covidexitstrategy.org. Uh, it integrates information related to all of those areas of kind of how well we're doing on containment that I talked about at the beginning. Uh, we support this along with some collaborating organizations and news groups in the United States. And I encourage you to, to go to that website if you're interested in all of these dimensions, you know, how hard hit is the healthcare system, how much testing are we doing, um, uh, how positive uh, uh, are the test rates, um, uh, how many more cases and so forth are we seeing? It's a, a good source of additional data. And on to the next slide, uh, again, this is a very diverse country with uh, diverse impacts. Um, so we are seeing an increase in hospitalizations and in deaths. Now, these are lagging indicators, you call them, because the hospitalizations tend to take place a week or so after the cases and the severe complications. You know, it's almost like there's several phases of a uh, severe case of COVID. The severe complications, the lung, uh, heart, and other systemic complications tend to occur a few weeks after that. So even though we've had a start to see a decline in cases again with this second phase, um, we're probably not going to see the decline in hospitalizations for a little while and the decline in deaths uh, for a little while too. Also, since there are some questions now about just how good we're, the job we're doing with testing, I showed you that recent decline, it's going to be especially important to watch what happens with hospitalizations. That may be a more sensitive measure than um, tests where we may be missing some of the data. Uh, I think the good news in all of this is that death rates are way down compared to what they were in the first wave in New York and New Jersey in April. That's partly because our healthcare systems are better prepared. They're stocked up. They've got more uh, capacity built in. The healthcare workers are still getting pretty stressed, I think, um, but they're um, able to handle more cases than, than we were re readily able to do back in April. Um, it's also because we're getting some treatments that, that work, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later and some more experience with cases. Um, but it's just a reminder that in order to contain the pandemic effectively, we really want to avoid stressing our healthcare systems too much because there is so much that we can do uh, for people who have COVID now, and hopefully that's going to get even better. And on to the next slide. Um, so where are we? Well, we, we didn't get uh, to the level of containment that many other countries have. The, the COVID virus is endemic means it's, it's everywhere um, in our neighborhoods. Uh, we've got um, uh, many parts of the country that do have relatively uncontained spread where we can't uh, go in with that testing and contact tracing and really eliminate um, outbreaks. So we're really in a different kind of phase, not only of the pandemic itself, but in our ability to manage it. Um, we are probably still going to need some pauses of economic uh, reopening and, and maybe some more intensive uh, close to sh shutdown, close to going back to, to sheltering in place. Some communities had to, had to do that around the country, the border region in Texas, for example, and, and uh, some other uh, communities as well. Um, it's not a, a great uh, solution, but may be needed, especially if there are resurges in the fall. Um, second is more public participation. You know, masks 
do work. The challenge is we have to all be in it together. They're not as effective as vaccines uh, or medical steps in, in eliminating spread. Uh, they do help, but that means that more people have to do it. So uh, mask use rates, the 80, 90% range, along with other things that go along with paying attention to, uh, to transmission, like uh, keeping distance six feet or more, preferably in open areas um, in terms of uh, distancing from others and avoiding large groups. Um, we've seen so many outbreaks and you've, you've had a share of the super spreader events there in Washington uh, between churches and, uh, and, and other kinds of events. So you know how uh, challenging this can be for containment if people don't all participate. So public education, engagement around this, it's nice to see that that's changing with some um, you know, Republican governors and, and others who have been hesitant in the past getting on board with supporting these efforts around the country. Um, but again, one other thing that other countries have done more of than the U.S. is enforcement actions. So, you know, we have rules about uh, fire code capacity in buildings. We've got rules about uh, no uh, indoor smoking. Um, we haven't done as good of a job enforcing the mask and other requirements when they do get put in place uh, in the U.S. as in other countries. And that's really part of the, the culture change that we need to, uh, on the non-medical side to, to get to better containment. Uh, we also need some more steps on testing. You know, testing so far has mainly been about doing these lab tests, uh, the PCR tests that are really accurate when people do have symptoms. Uh, the challenge is that we're at capacity uh, on our labs. We're trying to recruit more. That'll be helpful. But what we really need to do with so much COVID in the communities is more testing of people who don't have symptoms, so-called screening tests. Now that's different than a diagnostic test that you wanna make sure is really, really accurate for somebody who you think may have COVID. Those kinds of tests are what the PCR tests are for. They're covered by insurance under our CARES Act, you know, the emergency uh, COVID legislation passed earlier this year. So it's a good way to pay for them. We aren't in as good of shape with the screening tests. These are tests that can potentially be done at a point of care, maybe even at home. Some of you have seen like rapid flu tests or rapid pregnancy tests. They're typically not as accurate. So they're not great if you really wanna be sure um, that, that you're a patient or if you're someone with symptoms that you don't have COVID and, and you know, good reason not to go ahead with isolating and taking those usual COVID precautions uh, uh, if you're not sure. Uh, so they're not perfect for that. That. What they are really good for is if they're used repeatedly and regularly is detecting when an outbreak occurs sooner in a setting where it could be problematic, a nursing home, a school, a university, uh, a workplace. And this is why companies like Amazon and others are building in significant screening test capacity into their workplaces. And I think it's a potentially very valuable direction to go for the foreseeable future while we're going to have a lot of COVID around this. There's a challenge here, though, from a public policy standpoint in that there are many organizations like public schools or nursing homes that are funded mainly by Medicaid or um, low income uh, uh, communities that have been really hard hit by uh, the, the COVID outbreaks that just don't have the resources uh, to do this themselves. So what we haven't had yet at the federal level is national support uh, funding like we're doing for diagnostic testing, funding for screening tests uh, to come up with good guidelines and protocols for how to use them and to help those vulnerable communities and, and public organizations uh, like our schools, like our nursing homes uh, to get the support they need to implement these testing capacities effectively. Uh, finally, just a few words about um, uh, healthcare. Uh, we have been stressing our healthcare system all year long, and I really hats hats off to our health professionals in the hospitals on the front lines of responding to the pandemic and continuing to have to do this week after week uh, with so much COVID uh, in our communities. There are other important changes in healthcare to go along with that, though, and that includes paying our primary care doctors, our other healthcare providers, more to read design care. We've seen some steps in this direction with federal support for telehealth, you know, Medicare is doing that now, many private insurers. But if you look at many other industries, they've really gone much more virtual and localized. And one can imagine
imagine not just telehealth visits, but a lot more support for patients getting care that they need conveniently and at home. Dialysis now. Uh, you can get better results by using peritoneal dialysis that someone can do at home. They have a better quality of life and get out and do more things, uh, socially distance, um, than having to go into a dialysis facility three times a week where there have been repeated and fatal outbreaks of, uh, of COVID-19. Or cancer care. Uh, people with cancer often have depressed um, immune systems, so they're at bigger risk. It is possible to do chemotherapy and other kinds of advanced therapies for cancer at home now, too. It requires redesigning our care, paying for it in a different way. Same thing for many other serious illnesses that might otherwise end up in a, a nursing home or, or some other uh, facility where there, there is a higher risk of outbreaks. Um, so we've just started to start paying differently and to, to build out these new models of care. It's really important for healthcare that we don't reopen care in the same way. And there are many facilities that are used to being paid only when people come in for a visit or only when they come in for a procedure or a complication, trying to move away from that. There are many organizations in Washington that are moving towards new so-called value-based models of payment for healthcare that really can enable more flexibility in the way that care is delivered, get more treatments at home, get more early interventions, like helping people know about the outbreaks of COVID in their communities, especially if they're at higher risk and then get the care they need if they do have COVID without um, going to the hospital and really clogging up our healthcare system. So lots of opportunities there as well for reforming care. And I just wanna end with a couple of words on um, where we are with therapeutics. So uh, onto the, the, the next slide um, is a description of where we are with vaccine development. There are a lot of details here. Don't worry about all of them. I think the main thing I wanna convey is that there is an unprecedented effort to develop vaccines at an unprecedented pace, scale, and scope. And I think it is going to be relatively successful. Um, so instead of a long linear process where you do a bunch of preclinical testing and then clinical studies that may take a long time to enroll or may peter out if you, if you don't really get a bunch of healthcare organizations together to test at large scale, and then after that, and only after that, you start manufacturing the vaccine at large scale. That's why it takes years uh, to typically get a vaccine for any new infectious disease threat. In this case, we're going hyper parallel. So uh, the FDA, my former agency, has put out some very clear clear guidance about what they expect a vaccine to show, uh, to get into clinical testing, and then to show that it really does work, is safe and effective enough to be approved for large-scale use. At the same time, as you heard earlier from, uh, from Leslie, uh, we've set up national trial systems to do clinical trials of these vaccine candidates rapidly so that when the vaccines have as soon as they finish their clinical testing, there's large scale opportunity for enrollment. You know, unfortunately, the U.S. is the leading producer of COVID cases now. So we got a lot of places where uh, these trials can be conducted. And three of them for three vaccines are already underway or getting underway for the large scale testing for safety and effectiveness. And then we're also pre-doing all of the manufacturing. So not waiting to see if the vaccine actually works and then investing in scaling up to hundreds of millions of doses. But companies going in jointly with the federal government are spending billions of dollars now at risk uh, pre-making hundreds of millions of doses for the U.S. and for other populations worldwide so that if and when these vaccines are shown to be safe and effective enough, they'll be uh, available at significant scale. That is probably not going to be in September, October, or before the election, even though three of these are in clinical testing now. These large-scale tests are probably going to take at least several months to show that the vaccines work. The vaccines are probably not going to work perfectly. Think of like a flu vaccine, which either which may not uh, prevent the flu in everybody, but can reduce the severity and can reduce the number of cases. That's what we're looking for in these large scale tests now. So three different kinds of vaccines going through those large scale tests now, three more that the federal government is jointly backing that will be entering into clinical testing within the next couple of months. And that means the potential for vaccine availability late this year if everything goes well. And unfortunately, a lot of, of uh, vaccines that do make it to the stage end up not working that well. Fortunately, we have many different kinds of vaccine platforms many different so called shots on goal going along with this 
likelihood of a population. Some of it will go to our military uh, preparedness. Um, some of it will probably also go to high risk individuals, uh, those who are older, those who uh, are on the front lines of the healthcare uh, defenses. Um, but by next year, they should be more widely available. They will not work for everyone. They will probably not work perfectly. We will have a lot of work to do to get Americans comfortable with making informed decisions about whether the vaccine's right for them and, and, and their loved ones. So this is gonna take some months. And all that means we're gonna need other therapeutics as well. And just to finish up uh, with the, this last slide, uh, so the next slide, there are a range of therapeutics in development now. Uh, we already have one um, approved antiviral remdesivir that does reduce severity in hospitalized patients. It may work better for more. One challenge with uh, this antiviral remdesivir is that there is only limited capacity available. Back to my earlier point is that it's the scale of this pandemic that is so darn hard. Uh, that if you don't plan ahead for manufacturing millions and millions of doses, which is extraordinary, uh, even in the biotech industry, uh, you can end up with limited supplies. And that's what we have now with uh, one of our antivirals. Coming and also in clinical studies are immune modulators for these very severe cases. Uh, drugs that reduce immune response like steroids have proven to be effective in preventing complications and, and perhaps deaths. So more of those are in testing. They're making a difference in hospitalized patients. If we could find more of these treatments for severely ill patients that work, that could also help take the edge off the pandemic and, and reduce the burden on our, our, our hospitals and, and healthcare systems. Human antibodies, both in the form of uh, uh, serum from people who have recovered for COVID-19, a new study out on that this week suggesting it may be helpful, and so-called monoclonal or synthetic versions of neutralizing antibodies for the vaccine are in clinical testing now, could be available by fall. Again, the concern is going to be not only do these treatments really work, and I think there is, are some promising early results, but what kind of scale can we deliver? Can we really do advanced manufacturing for potentially millions of doses? Um, these human antibodies, if the vaccines don't work in some people because they can't mount a good immune response themselves or for some other reasons, these may be a long-term important part of COVID management, but we need to manufacture them at scale so they can be given safely and, and reliably to people who uh, are maybe been exposed to COVID, but, but you know, aren't yet coming down with uh, severe symptoms. That's gonna be another manufacturing challenge ahead between now and the fall. So lots of therapies in development, um, but probably some months where we're still gonna be facing a significant threat of COVID. And you know, for the vaccines, for the ther therapeutics, they're probably not gonna be perfect. In all likelihood, people are gonna have to get booster shots again in the next year or two. And we're heading into the fall. We're also dealing with the flu so the and, and other respiratory risks. So I do think there are gonna be some lasting changes here. I would like to see us doing more investment in testing, uh, including uh, in the business community. And, and for that, there needs to be more clear guidance and support from the federal government. Uh, I'd like to see more recognition that that business and work is gonna be different in healthcare too. So businesses thinking about how they can get care for their employees in ways where that care can be delivered much more at home uh, and in, in the community and not necessarily in, in hospitals. Uh, and hopefully continued progress on making these therapeutics available and the vaccines available at very large scale. So we're still very much in the midst of this. I, I hope the fall is gonna look better, but it is gonna depend on the things that we all do, uh, that we all do as individuals kind of following the guidance that we know works on reducing spread, things that we do uh, through our companies in terms of modifying our workplaces and, and uh, thinking about uh, testing along with those uh, modified uh, uh, protocols for, for going about work and things that we do through our government in terms of supporting the availability of better therapeutics and the availability availability of better treatments, especially for the vulnerable populations that have been so hard hit by the pandemic. Thank you all very much for the opportunity to join you today. And, and I've got a few minutes to stay around for, for questions, comments, uh, if you'd like to, if, if you all have any.
a lot of great questions coming through. One of the first things I wanted to start with is on the issue of masks. Uh, obviously, there's uh, a lot of controversy um, uh, about mask wearing it's a, and its efficacy. Duke University came out with a real groundbreaking uh, study on the efficacy of 14 masks this, uh, this last week. Thought you might uh, take a moment to tell us about uh, what that study tested and what it learned. So uh, great, great question. And, and Duke and others have been doing research on what masks work and how well. So a couple of things the uh, the, the really thin uh, masks uh, tend not to work as well. The ones that aren't designed for um, for, for medical use, um, but that may just be a thin materials. It's a covering that um, actually might not not stop the droplets uh, from getting out and spreading, but might just convert them to aerosols, may actually make things worse. There's another type of mask that makes things worse, and those are the ones with the valves on the side. So what those do is um, prevent you from, from breathing in particles, some particles in the environment, but it doesn't stop you from breathing them out. So it doesn't do any good and may actually be harmful for containing spread if, if you uh, happen to be asymptomatic and, uh, and carrying the, the virus. Um, and then the masks that have a couple of layers of cloth, maybe a little bit less comfortable or masks where you can insert a, a filter, even if it's like a, a coffee filter or paper filter, something like that, those seem to do okay. Surgical masks actually do pretty well. And we don't, we have uh, much more production of surgical masks than we did before. And of course the so-called N95 masks do the best, but those are, those are pretty uncomfortable to wear and uh, we have uh, only a limited supply of them. We really need them for our health professionals and people in these high risk settings. Those aren't recommended for, for everyday use. And I just add, uh, Joe, going along with that is um, it's not just the mask, but but keeping the six foot distance, um, avoiding the, the larger groups, all of those things really make a difference. Much of the spread that we're having now, you know, some of it's come through restaurants, bars, uh, kind of super spreader events, but many of them are also through other more private gatherings, uh, churches, family reunions, people getting together to watch the now reinstituted uh, uh, baseball games or, or basketball games in big groups. Um, those are the things that are contributing to a lot of the spread. So it's not just mass, but, but a couple of other steps that if we could all take them together, make a huge difference in containing the pandemic. That's great. It was really interesting, uh, really interesting study to read and certainly got a lot of uh, uh, publicity over the last few weeks. Uh, as I hear my children upstairs studying at the University of Amazon Prime on the couch, I have to ask the uh, I have to ask the question about schools and the transmissibility of the virus among uh, young populations. What's the data showing? We're hearing a lot of conflicting evidence. Uh, is it safe to go back to school? Is it not? Is it safe for certain populations or certain age groups? Uh, what's the data data tell us? Yeah, so just like everything else with the pandemic, we're learning along the way. I think the really good news is that children have a much lower rate of having serious symptoms from COVID than any other population group. And especially for the under 10 groups, uh, some there have been some um, severe cases in, in very young babies, neonates who are exposed, but for the most part, ki kids do pretty well. And that's not to say that they never have severe consequences and there aren't deaths or other long-term problems like a multi-system immune reaction uh, condition that's been described, but, but fairly rarely. So uh, from the standpoint of health risk directly, um, the news is relatively good for children, um, especially younger children. Where things get more murky and problematic is around the role of children with spread. Um, there now have been a lot of studies showing that children do indeed, uh, uh, that are infected, uh, they do have a lot of virus um, in, in their nose and it seems like they could be contagious. Uh, there haven't been probably as many contagion events involving kids as involving adults and some of the super spreader events that I talked about earlier, but kids are actually an important part of transmission. Um, Israel tried to reopen schools without a whole lot of um, attention to testing and containment and uh, have had some uh, teacher infections and, and deaths and, and spreads through uh, kids there. Um, there's a recent study of that, um, uh, that that Washington, that famous Washington church uh, super spreader event where, where kids under 15 were actually a significant part of like contributed a third or more of the total number of, you know, 80 plus cases that came out of that one event. So I don't think we can take for granted that just sending kid back to, kids back to school 
school and hoping that they don't transmit is going to work. I think that all the steps that schools are trying to implement around modified schedules, um, more distancing, including not just in classrooms, but when kids are moving between class or for lunch or transportation to and from the school, all those are important to consider. And the fact of the matter is, if you look at the views of Americans, you know, two thirds of parents are uncomfortable sending their kids back to school right now, given current conditions in their communities. This is an area where I think testing could, could help as well. Um, so some districts like uh, Aurora, Colorado, um, uh, some districts in uh, New Orleans that, that are trying to reopen without too much activity of COVID in the community are doing regular testing of teachers and maybe thinking about some um, screening tests for some of the older students as well. Um, so most important uh, for, for all this is getting the rate of COVID down in the community. So there's a lower risk of, uh, of outbreaks in any particular school. But this is a case where I think, um, like I talked about before, testing, a screening test could be very helpful in, in protecting um, staff and, and, and maybe in reducing spread among students too. Got a, a number of questions about uh, the data of the of the uh, of COVID and what qualifies as a positive test and is there uniformity about what a COVID death is uh, not only across the fifty states but also internationally? Is it uh, any death that occurs with someone who was tested positive? Is it a you know a certain trigger in terms of the the suspected? Uh, a contribution that the virus had towards uh, towards the mortality. Uh, is there uniformity, or are we still trying to sift through different uh, different layers of data that might not be uh, that might have the same term, uh, but are t uh, qualified in very different ways? Yeah, Joe, I think we're getting towards more uniformity. I mean, back before testing was widely available in, in China, for example, during their initial outbreak, they classified cases based on a, a long x-ray and symptoms because they didn't have um, the capacity to do large scale testing. And that probably undercounted um, uh, cases significantly. Um, on the other hand, because so many people who do get COVID don't have serious symptoms, especially when it's gotten prevalent, like it has in the US, um, um, you, you may have a number of people who have you know, underlying heart disease or other conditions happen to have COVID at the same time, and it really wasn't the COVID that caused the death. So the U.S. has tried to move to um, basically what you're saying, kind of a primary determination. Was COVID a, uh, did COVID appear clinically to be, was it not only present, but it appeared to be a, a primary contributor to the death. Um, in addition to that, we're trying to capture data on all COVID cases among people who die in case they're it's going to be very helpful to understand these interactions uh, more fully. Um, I think the bottom line from our counts, though, is that we are no question way undercounting the, the total number of cases, probably at this point in many parts of the U.S. that have been relatively hard hit, 15, 20 percent of the population may have been exposed. Um, for most of the, of the, the U.S., um, probably that number is closer to three, four, five percent of the population. That's still many times larger than the total number of official cases we've counted. So I think no question we're missing some deaths. Um, some studies that have been done recently looking at um, excess deaths. So what, what's the average uh, number of deaths that you'd expect in an area based on what happened in, you know, 2018, 2019 versus what we're seeing so far this year? Those numbers are bigger than the, the number of COVID deaths that we're reporting. And the number of cases, I think, is, is much bigger than, than what we've been able to report. And Joe, I think you may be on mute. <laughs> I do that from time to time. Um, <laughs> you know, one of the interesting uh, things that gets pointed to is lockdown, no lockdown, social distancing, masks, and the policies that different governments are, are putting in place. And Sweden has always obviously been a big uh, outlier in their response to the virus. Mm -hmm. And certainly we've seen a higher per capita death count there. Um, but is there a sense that herd immunity might be uh, uh, catching on there at a much lower percentage infection rate or that they handled it in a better or worse way? And, and uh, what jurisdictions do we point to to say, hey, you're doing it right and here's why? Yeah, I don't think um, most of the world views Sweden as a success. I mean, it's an understandable effort to, to try. And if you look at the numbers and you didn't think your healthcare systems were going to be that overwhelmed, you think you've got like good public health measures in place to 
do things like um, you know distancing and, and preventing spread. Um, that was essentially the approach that they took. Um, their, as you said, their their case rates have been much higher. Their mortality rates have been uh, much higher, and um, they're not close to where they need to be for getting herd immunity. Still, only around you know twenty percent or or so of the population, even in Stockholm, that's that's been exposed, and less in other areas. So they've they've been, they've been implemented some modifications to their approaches, which. Um, if a country like U.S. is going to go that route, would really be helpful. They include uh, um, much more uh, aggressive steps to help contain spread in higher risk populations. They've got um, uh, more testing and stronger um, uh, kind of public health measures than, than we've consistently put in place. Um, but if you look at the overall consequences, you know, on health, it's, it's definitely not as good. And um, also a lot of uncertainty facing people there about about their health risks um, and more mortality. Um, it's also not as good from an economic standpoint of you know, uh, in terms of economic recovery, the places that are doing better are places like Germany um, that were able to get to that initial level of containment and then put in place testing that is substantial relative to the number of cases that they have and screening testing in areas that are higher risk. And they have a lot fewer high risk areas, say, than the United States does just because they've got that, you know, the level of the virus down um, so much more. So that's probably more of the, the model that, that many um, countries around the world are, are aspiring to. Um, and we are a ways from that in the U.S. You know, I talked about some steps that would help get us there. So more attention to masks and distancing, maybe through requirements and enforcement of those requirements so that it gets to be part of the culture. And I know this is really tough with um, American culture of, of, uh, uh, of independence, but, you know, it's not forever. This is just for getting us through the next uh, uh, year or, or limited time period till we have stronger vaccines and we have more effective treatments and we have better testing capacity in place and then making progress on all those things too. And especially testing is something I think we could do uh, a much better job of in, in ramping up in the next few months. Uh, uh, companies like Adaptive that we talked about before, others do have um, uh, tests that can potentially help us much better identify outbreaks and understand immunity uh, and help us take steps short of just another type of shutdown to try to get containment. I think maybe I have time for one more if, uh, if you all are still, if there are any more. Uh, the, the messaging of the virus and, and what we've seen on everything from social media to out of the mouths of politicians to in the mainstream media to what companies are doing in response. What's the biggest lie or the biggest waste of money that uh, that we've been putting into our response to COVID that either has been uh, an ineffective response or has been just an outright fabrication uh, about uh, about the virus and its path uh, through our community. Well, Joe, we've we've taken a lot of steps in response, no question about that. But we haven't gone, um, at least in most parts of the country, to probably the level that's needed. You know, I started out with a few key points about what good foundations for containing a pandemic like this look like, for really keeping the virus from disrupting a whole lot of economic activity and causing um, very big uh, health consequences as well. And we're definitely not there um, in, in just about all parts of the country. And because people move around, if you're not there in some parts, you're probably going to have a hard time getting there in any part. So I would like to see us do more on testing. I'd like to see us do um, the, the support that we've got for vaccines is great. I'm worried about not having enough capacity for the therapeutics that are coming along in the meantime. Just for reference, you know, I talked about those monoclonal antibodies to um, to COVID that could potentially be available this fall. Great technology, including some uh, companies in, in your area. Uh, but they need to be thinking big in terms of manufacturing scale, millions of doses. And if you look at the whole manufacturing capacity for monoclonal antibodies in the United States for every 
kind of treatment, including cancer, including many immune conditions, including many other very serious conditions, um, we can manufacture about maybe 40, 45 million doses here, only about 60, 70 million doses uh, worldwide. Um, that is not enough capacity for really containing uh, the pandemic soon with therapeutics like monoclonal antibodies. And we're seeing these shortages of, uh, of remdesivir and antiviral now. So I'd really like to see that ramp up. And I'd like to see our testing, especially our screening tests, tests that can be done at uh, a workplace or, or in a community or even at home uh, to help us get a better handle on when and where outbreaks are occurring. Most important in the meantime, though, is wear a mask, uh, keep the six foot distance, avoid groups that are bigger than 10. Um, we've got enough COVID in enough places in the US that I don't think there are any um, places that, that shouldn't be taking at least those steps. And, and we really need to get you know, 80, 90% of people on board uh, with doing that regularly to, to get to effective pan, uh, pandemic containment. And uh, I know there's a lot that your members are trying to do to, to deal with all this in the short term as well as plan for the long term. And and I hope you'll keep it up. I know people talk a lot about um, COVID fatigue um, in, the, in the sort of the life of our country. This is not going to be a long period, I don't think. We are going to get vaccines. We are going to get therapeutics. It's just a question of how fast we can do it and how well we can contain and, and limit the, the health and economic damage in the meantime. And we do still have some more work to do there. Dr. Mark McClellan, thank you so much for going a little long with us today. There's just been so much interest in this and you're just uh, the, the expert we needed to walk us through it. So thanks so much for taking the time and being with us. Thank you. Thank you all for attending this final webcast of our leadership conference. It's been a pleasure to host you each morning, uh, Friday morning this uh, summer here in my basement. <laughs> if you missed any of these amazing speakers or programs during our Future of Work Leadership Conference, you can watch them anytime on demand at bellevuechamber.org slash webcast, or you can click the link on your screen. As always, we've got one final thing to do before we close for the day. Uh, Amazon has provided an Echo Dot to raffle off each week. And so we are going to spin the wheel and see which one of you lucky folks is going to go home with a, or receive an Echo Dot from home. And it looks like that big winner is Mark C. Mark C, we will get that to you right away. I want to again thank our presenting sponsor, Amazon, our major sponsors, AT&T, Microsoft, Puget Sound Energy, King County, and the City of Bellevue for your great support. We hope you'll join us for a number of our programs coming up this fall, so please stick around in just a moment to take a brief survey on how we can improve our virtual experience here at the Bellevue Chamber. I want to give a special thanks to my staff for doing such an amazing job of putting this conference on this year. It is a lot of work to get uh, uh, dozens of speakers and, uh, and topics and the logistics all worked out. I want to make a particular call out to Olivia Mullen on our staff for uh, working through all of our technology issues and getting everybody organized. Did a great job. Very proud of the work that we're doing here at the Bellevue Chamber. Uh, until we see you again at one of our virtual events, or hopefully next year in person, if uh, optimism can be believed, stay healthy, stay safe, and we will see you next time.